if I've ever wondered how to get two screens doing two different things at once on a microcontroller, in this case, the SP32, then stick around. Roll those titles. Is that it? <sighs> Okay, some prerequisites. We're using RLI9341 driver screens. Although these are two different sizes, they both use the same driver. So that's essential. We're also using the TFT ESPI library by Bodmer. Now, bit of a caveat with that. It was never designed to run two screens, so it's a bit of a kludge what we'll be doing to get this to work, but it's not a big kludge. I'll hold your hand all the way, as long as you've washed it, and you'll see that actually the work required is, is quite minimal. And we're only going to look at the basic wiring for two screens. If you want to look in detail about wiring up a single screen and in fact installing the TFT ESPI library, then see this video, which we'll put a link up somewhere around about here and there'll be a link down below as well. I would suggest if you've not got your ESP32 wired up to a single screen yet, then you do need to do that video, get it all working with one screen first, and then come back and look at this one. The SBI bus is, as the name suggests, it's a bus. Why is that are designed to have multiple devices connected to them to exchange information to whatever device deals with that data. But you can't have more than one device using the bus at once. So the bus master, or most, more usually the CPU, the MPU, the microcontroller that we're using, controls which device has access to that bus or listens on that bus at any one time. To do this, every SPI device has a chip select pin, or perhaps a more accurate name, in this scenario, would be device select. Whichever. When this pin is set to low, then the device can use the bus. If high, then it cannot use the bus. Looking at the diagram, when the CPU wants to send data to screen 1, it makes a chip select on IO10, could have been any IO, but we've used 10 in this case, sets that to low and ensures that IO11, the select for screen 2, is high. We can now send whatever we want to screen one, and screen two will happily ignore it. If we want to write to screen two, then we would set pin 11 low and set 10 high, etc. Now with these screens, because they only ever passively listen to the bus, we could actually send the same data to both screens at once and get them to both display that same data, whatever it may be. However, there is some trouble, as I mentioned earlier, with the TFT ESBI library. It requires you to set which pin is the chip select pin in a settings header file, which if you've watched the other video I linked to earlier, you'll be aware of. Library will then set and unset this pin as it sees fit when it's writing data to the screen. So as much as you might want to use this pin for one of the screens, you can't, as you need to explicitly control when it is low or high. And unfortunately, the library will ignore you and set this pin itself, no matter what you might want it to be. So we still need to tell the library to use a certain pin, but we will then ignore this pin, not connect it to anything, not use it in any way whatsoever, and we'll use whatever other pins we want to, to use for the chip select, so that we control them explicitly. Generally, the default for the library is pin 5 on an ESP32, so we'll leave that as it is. This means that pin 5 cannot be used for anything else, whether it's with the screens, with another sensor, whatever, you've got to leave it alone, because that library is going to fiddle with it. I've covered connecting up these screens, as I mentioned before, in a video and an article linked to my website, so I won't go into much detail. Refer to the circuit diagram and the picture of the breadboard circuit. Power, ground, and LED backlight are connected as you expect. The screen resets are both connected together and go to pin D4 on the SP32. The DCs are connected together also and go to pin D2. I think, I think this stands for data control, copy wrong, 
I've not really been bothered to look it up, but that seems to make sense. It basically tells the screen if the date arriving for it is for the registers to set up various parameters for this display screen or the actual screen display data itself, you know, for graphics and images and whatever. The MOSI, MOSI, whatever, connection of the SBI bus is the connection that the screen uses to receive data. We can tie these together too. It is a bus. Things are all designed to be connected together on that same bus. And we can get those to D23. The clocks SCK are also obviously tied together because it's a bus. They will be connected together for both screens and, and they will go to pin D18. So here we are at the most important pins for our task. The chip selects of the two screens. Screen one goes to D22 and screen two to D21. Notice that pin five is not connected to anything. Like we said, because it will be used by the library and so we cannot use it for any purpose. Forget it's there, ignore it. So by changing pins 21 and 22, we can control which screen our code and thus the library talks to. Let's look at some examples. So this is a really simple piece of code, simple intro, where we just write the same data to both screens at once. So we can control two screens, same data at once. So we've been good little boys and girls and we've used variable names for our pin numbers. So you can see large screen is set to pin 21, as we mentioned earlier, small screen, pin 22. In the setup, we're setting both to be output pins for those two, because it's the chip select, and we're going to control those chip selects. So they need to be outputs. And then in these next two lines, we just send them both low. That's it, because we're going to write to both at the same time. We want them both to listen to that data bus. We set the rotation, so the, ori the rotation, so the orientation is how we want it. We initialize TFT, and remember these are both, all these com commands are gonna be going to both the screens simultaneously, and then rather uninspiringly, we write that sentence. Let's uh, have a quick look at that. In action, we'll bring that up on the screen, and uh, yeah, I didn't say it was exciting, did I? But there you go. If you want to do two screens at once, which you might want for some, uh, some scenario, you can basically just tie the chip selects together if you wanted to and just run your normal code and that would power two screens at once. Obviously, we want to do something a little bit more advanced than that and have do two different things on two screens at once. And that's what we'll move on to next. So in this one, we're going to write two different things to each screen. Initially, the start is the same. And we're actually enabling both screens here to listen to the on the SPI bus. So we're going to set both to the same rotation and we're going to initialize both screens the same. They've both been initialized and set up the same with that code. But here, by raising the small screen pin chip select high, using that one there, we're effectively switching it off from the SPI bus. It's not going to listen anymore. So then we do this. Write the phrase large screen, which means at the moment, only the large screen's chip select is low. So that will listen, and that screen will print the words large screen on it. And we have a small delay, and then we lower the chip select for the small screen. So now the small screen is listening. But we only want the small screen to listen, we don't want the large screen to listen. So on the next line, we raise its chip select to high. So now, only the small screen is listening. And we send out a small draw, you know, produce that screen, write that straight string to the screen. And in essence, that's it. That's all you need to do. Whether it's two screens or several, just control the CS lines, chip select lines, as appropriate, and make sure you don't use the CS line assigned to be used by the library for anything. In our case, pin five. You can use any, as far as I've tested, routines in the library, and all should be good. We'll now move on to the advanced demo. Now, all these demos, all these examples I've shown, are available 
On my website, there's a page dedicated to this video. You'll find a link down below to the actual website. All the code is available on there. In particular, the more advanced demo I'm just going to show you here is available to download via link. I've not listed the source code at all because it is quite lengthy, as you can see. So due to that, I will be going through it here. It is rather complicated because it's actually two of the examples that come with the TFT, yes, TFT SBI library joined together. So there's like a boing ball example and a cube that's spinning rotating in space example. And I've merged them together. So we've got one on one screen, one on the other. Now, this was actually relatively complicated, not because of anything in particular from what we've done already. Nothing digresses from the fact that it's just a simple switching of the chip select pin. It was just the fact that the code was written with some variables that had the same name and little icky, icky things like that. Oops, little icky things like that that I had to just sort out. So nothing technical, just, you know, when you're mangling two pieces of code that were never designed to put together was a problem. But in principle, it's just the same. If you look at the loop here, you can see that I call, ignore the start, right, then right. You can see that I call the boing ball code then I call the bouncing cube code once per time around this loop. So it's updating those both codes. And if we go to this example of the bouncing cube code here, you can see that when I call the bouncing cube code, the bouncing cube code, the first thing I do is turn on the large screen. And then if we go down to the end of this code, the last thing I do is turn off that screen. So only that screen is on when we're doing that code. And then at the end of it, turns it off. And then if we try and find the bouncing ball, a quick look, boing ball, there you go, same thing. I turn on just a small screen, and at the end of that code, I will turn off the small screen. And then, of course, it will repeat, and we'll go round and round again, basically writing that code for whatever it was, whether it's the rotating cube or the boing ball, to its appropriate screen. But of course, you don't get something for nothing. If you think you're going to write a dual screen game, maybe a remake of Donkey Kong Game & Watch, then beware. You are now writing twice as much data to the screens, so basically half the speed. Of course, depending on how you design your code, this might not be a problem. Careful and clever coding, only updating what is strictly necessary, can make a tremendous difference but that's for you to discover as you go along. Hope this has been helpful. If it has, please consider subscribing, supporting the channel in the usual ways that everybody says. The links, you'll find them all below. Really appreciate the people that do. Mate, it's, it's such a big thank you. You'll also find that new, I think it's called Super Thanks or something. I don't know. You'll find a clicky link under the video somewhere. If you want to use that, nobody's used that yet. If you feel like doing that, thanks very much in advance. But... As we know, for the entire world, things are a bit tight with money at the moment, aren't they? So, yeah, do, don't worry if you, you, don't, you don't want to. Just, yeah, you just look after yourselves. Things are tough at the moment. So, anyway, so until next time, see you later. And thanks very much for watching.